Yeah, you can just start now. It's fine. Oh, I'll point to this. So this is on the screen, right? If that's out. Is this out? Yeah, it is. Where's the, where's the, if you can spend more time there, I can move it. I'm just curious. Right here, right, right now. Here. Okay. All right, then. So for those, I know some of you, some of you have had class with me. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, you may know of me, but if you care to, you can find out about me. It's, it wouldn't be terribly hard to do that, but you'll see, um, if you look around for me, I'm currently affiliated with two organizations. One is Team Cymru, and it is pronounced Cymru. Uh, not obviously, but it, that's the way we, we say it. Uh, but also, DePaul University is a part-time instructor. I don't teach very often, maybe a couple of times a year, usually a networking class. I used to work at DePaul University doing networking-related things, some security as well, a number of years ago. You may also see me uh, affiliated or have been affiliated with an organization called UltraDNS, which is now Newstar and Northwestern. So if you see a John Christoph all affiliated with one of those organizations, that's all probably. Um, at the very end, I'll have a link to my Team Carmi homepage and my DePaul homepage. I put the slide deck on uh, a section on my Team Carmi homepage, so if you want that from me directly after, but apparently I think that will be made available to you as well. So let me, let me, I should start um, and properly thank Alex and all of you for coming and inviting me. Uh, we'll spend, I know we have maybe about an hour, I'm told we could go over, I suppose, if you're all willing to. We have food, you may want to, um, we may want to cut a little bit short so you don't fall asleep. And I would like to make this as much interaction as possible so it doesn't, it's not just me lecturing so we can actually have a discussion. I think that will tend to be the most valuable part of this. But I have a few things to say. I have uh, three things, three distinct sections uh, to this discussion uh, to go over. First, it will be a foundational part where we'll talk about how DNS works. Now, I won't have time to cover everything. I'll have time to cover uh, at least some of the most important parts that will be uh, prudent for the things that uh, can follow. And if you pay attention to those, then the rest of the stuff will, will fall right into place. Um, the second part is where it will be a little fun for me, and I should preface the, this by maybe uh, with a little warning. And it, 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 it ask, is, is anyone here, I don't think anyone's faculty, but does anyone work for CDM in the IT department? Anyone, no one wants to admit it anyways. Okay. Well, they'll find this eventually. We're going to have a little fun at their expense. And I'm not going to be... Um, directing this to any one person, but we'll see the institution person. Um, and then the last section will be uh, about something that has come up. Uh, well, it's been an ongoing discussion in the so-called DNS community for a while, um, but it's come up with me personally not long ago in a discussion with a student I had had. And a uh, reference to my name coming up in some other class. And uh, it annoyed me a bit the context of this discussion, and so. Um, I, I, I set out to see what we ought maybe to do, if anything, uh, about this particular issue. And so I'm actually doing a very brief um, discussion next week at a network operation meeting. So there's a little bit of a preview of that, it's a little bit of a warm up for me, and engage your reaction as well. And I'll, I'll be able to tune up for next week. Um, that I may trim a little bit just for the sake of time. So there's a fair amount of material to get through. If, you're, um, if you haven't seen the slides already, there's a fair number of pages. So with that, um, we should get started. If you've taken a class with me before, you've seen a slide that looks like this. But if not, let me just say to you that of all the protocols in the TCP IP protocol suite, there's two subsystems of that protocol suite that I consider the most important. I think most reasonable people in the network operator community will agree. One is the naming system, which we know and use as domain name system in DNS. The other is the routing system, and for all practical purposes, that's PGP. So obviously, we're going to talk about DNS. All of you and all systems, per the specification, use or at least have the capability to use DNS. All your systems have it. 
it's everywhere. Now, but it may be possible that you don't have to use it, but everything essentially has it in this TCP IP. Um, and so for that reason, DNS, I think, is quite interesting, just because it is everywhere. Now, there's not that many things you can say about applications or protocols that it really is everywhere, and it's used you know, for almost everything. But DNS is one of those things. And uh, for security people, which I assume many of you are, I know some of you are, um, that certainly will find the work that you do. So there's three components that I'm, I'm going to uh, just enumerate for you that are key to understanding how DNS works. So three systems, if you will, um, or the three functions that are performed in the domain name system. So we'll kind of work from the left to the right. The ones to the left that you'll be um, perhaps more familiar with, if not in name, in the context that you're exposed to and use directly on a regular basis. On the left-hand side is essentially you, the end users, all your laptops and your tablets and phones. Anything that has TCP IP and it has what's generally just referred to as a stub resolver. It's basically a relatively small piece of software that comes in your operating system. It's not much more than an API interface to the domain name system. But it's a limited amount of functionality for you to get some information about a name. I'm taking some liberties that I assume most of you, if not all of you, know at least a little bit about DNS, and I don't have to explain all the basics because you understand domain names and you resolve them and sometimes for IP addresses and so forth. So I'll skip a lot of the very basic detail um, and focus more on the, on the core components that, that may, you may not be as familiar with. So this is what you all have and what you all probably use. In the middle, what you have to rely on when you have a start resolver is some sort of full service resolver. Sometimes it might be a forwarder. Um, which forwards to another full service resolver, or sometimes referred to as a local caching server. I think all these names, for our practical purposes, it's effectively the same. When you boot up your laptop here at DePaul, you probably use DHCP, and it gives you a couple of DNS servers, right, if you look in your config. What you're getting is a couple of IP addresses. Those perform the function of searching the DNS so called namespace. So if you have a question about a name, that question will ultimately make its way to one of the boxes in the middle, and they'll go find the answer for you. So you have a, a direct point-to-point -point relationship with, um, with the caching server. But then this group in the middle, they will have to search potentially all over the world for the information. They'll do all the like. So they're, they're sort of what you're going for. Now the things on the right, this is the actual namespace. And the things that actually contain, store, maintain, they're authoritative. They have definitive knowledge for the actual data, the domain name that we're all interested in. So now it is the case that some of these things could be combined, or maybe you know need the stub resolver. For example, my laptop, I don't use my stub resolver. I put my own local caching server right on my laptop, and I just do all the work myself on my laptop. You might do that on a mail server for performance reasons. So there's some things you can you can skip or combine. You can run a full resolve or an authoritative server. Although generally that's not advised, but in fact, the Paul's main domain name servers do that. One of the last, not necessarily a regret, but if I had stayed with Paul go along, that would probably been one of the things I would have changed. I just never got around to that piece. It's not a problem, but um, usually it's best to think about these as separate, anyways, even if you don't do them in practice. Just logically, it makes sense to think about this one. So, those are the, the three components um, that we're concerned with. We're, you know, we'll mostly be looking um, over this. Part here, we get to talk about CDMs, DNS advantage. So let me go through an example with you so you understand the process of how this works. We're all in the same <coughs> have a little bit of this background knowledge that some of you have seen with me before, but maybe it be a nice refresher. If we wanted to perhaps pull up the web page for a sec demons, for instance, what we're probably interested in is the IP address. Now there's other things we could be interested in, but we're usually interested in IP addresses. So that's what, that's what we care about. So if you're on your laptop and you fire up a browser and you type it in that name, what's going to happen is some transition happens and we generate a message and that gets sent out to one of your local caching servers saying, hey, I'm interested in this information about the name. So can you go perform the work on my account? So that's all that's happening. That caching server then has to go out and search the namespace. And so I've broken up the namespace here into three groups. Um, and I'll show you uh, in a different, pictorially different, uh, a different view of this. Uh, so graphically, you'll have a better picture of it to your mind. But it'll search through different parts of the namespace for, for what it means. It's 
that's a distributed database. And so this bit of information that we're interested in is not in one centralized database. There's no one central DNS database in the world, right? There's pieces of it all over the place. DePaul has its piece, Northwestern has its pieces. We're going to assume, for our example, that when we ask this question, that our local server, the caching server, the full service resolver, has never been asked this question before. And in fact, it doesn't hasn't been asked any questions before. Perhaps it just came online. So the whole idea of the caching server is that people ask the questions, and as it gets answers, it caches those answers for the next person it can give up to, so it doesn't have to go really chase it down again. But it hasn't done that. It's, 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 its memory is essentially clean. It doesn't have any uh, learned information from anyone else yet. So that way we can see the step-by-step -step process of how Well, if you don't have any information about the namespace, so that upside-down tree that hired you're, you, you might be at um, crossroads. You might say, well, how do we start the search? Do we just sort of dive into this big pool of water anywhere? Well, we have to have a way in. We have to have a way in the next place we start at the top, what we call the root. And so you do have to know something. So these caching servers do have a little bit of information. You get this because when you install the software, it comes with it by default, or you can get it separately. You can download what's called a root hints file. And so there is some static information that you give your your caching server initially for it to see, be seeded with, to get into the namespace to start. And in fact, when it, the first time it starts up, it'll contact one of those root servers in that hard-coded list, and it'll ask for a fresh copy of the list in case the local one has something changed. So you have this way in with, with this list of root servers. And so, um, the root servers are relatively simple. There's not a whole lot of information about the root servers. There's only 13 instances of them. And I use that term instances for a reason. There's, there's not physically 13 root servers. If there are only 13 servers, they would have to be incredibly powerful and reliable and robust um, and trustworthy. Now, at one time, there was only 13 physical servers, but a long, long time ago. Um, but now, today, and for many years, hence, there's actually been many of each individual of the 13. It's not normally be a like, load balancing device, like you might be familiar with. It's usually, uh, you get duplicated instances using something called AnyCast, which we won't go into, but it's something you should uh, go learn about if DNS is something you're interested to you. But there's, these 13 um, instances uh, are the way in. So you pick one, and then you can start your search. Now, this is, if, if you remember that this is not how it works, what I'm about to tell you, then you will know more DNS than 95% of all your colleagues, possibly your potential coworkers, maybe your boss, most of the people in the industry about DNS, if you can remember this. When that local caching server goes to the root, when it starts its search, because it's going to chase down the IP address for secdaemons.org, right? What does it ask of the root server? What it does not ask, it does not say, hey, what are the four name servers? That's not the question that it asks. It asks the exact same question that the original stub result asks. It asks the root, hey, what's the IPv4 address for secdamons.org? It asks the exact same question. That's actually very important um, to understand that process. And I know that some, maybe not you in this room, but I know some of yours those students don't know this or didn't learn it properly because they've taken my class and then they told me after, that's not the way we learned it after I explained it to them. And I was, well, I'm glad you're in my class because now you've learned it properly and hopefully we can remove that bad information. But if you remember that, and, and I'd be interested to know if you come across a class in your career here at DePaul, if you're being taught it wrong, and then I'll maybe do another talk like this and we'll take a few whacks at some people. Um, so this is not the process. Uh, that happens, you, you do this. You ask the exact same question. Now, if you're a root operator, as a root server operator, that's actually kind of interesting, right? You get to see queries that people make. Now, you actually don't get to see every query that everybody makes. Remember, because the caching effect. But the ones that make it to the root, you get to see the kinds of questions people ask. That's really kind of cool. So if you're one of those operators, you get to see a lot of cool information. So I used to work at a company, Ultra DNS. We didn't run a root server. We ran one of the org, ser we ran the org servers, we ran 
um, US and UK servers and info and, and biz and some other stuff. And it's really interesting to see what things are being looked at. Um, now, it, it actually may be the case that you could see your IP address, your client IP address, because there's a thing called EDNS client zero. That's, not really new. That's a discussion for another day. Okay, so continually, the root gets asked this question, and the root does not know the answer. I'll just tell you straight up. The root has a limited amount of information. Root, there's no centralized DNS database. It doesn't know everything. It actually has a relatively small amount of information. The root really only knows about the name servers one level below it. That's really all it knows. It knows that there's name servers for .org. It knows there's name servers for .edu. Basically, it knows a bunch of name server information. It doesn't really know any IP address information for anything. There was a time, long, long time ago, where it might have, but today it does not. So the root's not going to have the answer, but that doesn't mean the root won't respond. The root will respond, and the root will say, look, I don't know the answer, but I know something you apparently don't know. I know something that will get you closer to the answer. Since you're asking me, and I'm the top of the tree, let me point you down towards the branch of the tree that will get you towards the answer. Here's, here's a referral. Here's a redirect to this list, one of these list of names, or pick one of those and go ask one of them. So that's the, what the root server is going to do. It's not going to provide an answer, it's going to provide a referral. But that's better than nothing. It, what the root does recognize that you ask something in .org, because so it's reading that label from right to left. So it's going to point you to the one of the .org servers. Now I asked this question too, and, and I, I really like comparing it because I've asked um, students this, I've asked network operators this, I've asked <coughs> faculty this question before. And it's interesting, the results, and I'll tell you as soon as after we're done going through it ourselves. Who believes that the caching server, having gone up to this step thus far, has not only learned something, but has now cached something in memory? I want you to raise your hand if you think yes. One person, two people, you're very shy about this. Three people, some of you have taken my class, I'm very disappointed if you're not raising your hand, because you should be raising your hand. But the results are actually not much different from operators and faculty, so don't feel too bad about that. Um, but it has learned something, clearly, right? It has learned the list of org servers, and it's going to remember that for next time. It's actually going to probably learn a better copy later. Um, but it, it has at least an initial copy of the org name servers. It actually has the IP addresses as well. I would show you them. It has the IP addresses, or some of the IP addresses, too. Ultimately, as you go through this process, you will come to one of these two name servers, NS1 or NS2 Bluehost. That has the definitive knowledge. That's the authoritative or the authoritative set of servers that knows what the IP address is for second user or and it'll respond saying, here's the address, and you get some auxiliary information like the TTL, which says you can cache it for this many seconds. Don't cache it for any more, um, but if you keep it around for that long time, that's fine. Um, it should be bad. Okay. And then the caching server will, of course, pass it back on to the original stub result. So that, that's the essential process. Now let me um, do a little bit bigger picture to show you more elaborate means by which this is conducted for each, for each step. But I'm happy if, if anyone wants to interrupt me and clarify anything or ask questions. I'm too shy. So here's um, a little more. Um, schematic of, of what the process might look like. So here's the stuff resolver. You ask the question of the caching server. Second step is, well, let me see if I have it in my cache. We're assuming no for everything. So it goes to the root. The root says, I don't know, but here's a referral. Okay, that's helpful. I'll remember that. Let me go ask one of the org servers. Okay, I, you don't know either, um, but you have a list of name servers. The list is ns1 and ns2 bluehost.com. Okay, great. I'll cache that. Now I have to ask either NS1 or NS2, um, but I probably didn't get IP addresses associated with this. Um, so now what I do, the reason I didn't get IP addresses is because Bluehost.com, the org server's not going to probably have IP addresses for .com on its own. So guess what? So we actually go, we have to suspend this process and now go look up an IP address for NS1 or NS2. Is this common? Yeah, this happens all the time. People have the name servers for their zone having a totally different TLD. It's not uncommon. 
Is it optimal? Uh, I guess not academically, right? We're going to have to incur some additional queries that we might not have had to incur. Not a big deal, especially not for something. If you were, if you're doing like high performance, high transactions kinds of stuff, it may, may be more important to you, but it doesn't usually matter. For us. Okay, so we do have to suspend, and then we have to go look up the Bluehost, one of the Bluehost name servers. We go through a similar kind of process. There's an authoritative server for the Bluehost domain. That gives us an answer for NS1. Now we sort of return from that branch and finish looking at start means. That will then ultimately provide us the answer. So there's a number of process steps that it takes to get through that resolution process. And it could be a fair number. And if you're if you're really a creative security person, you might be thinking of some creative ways to like really wreak havoc on the system, right? What if I had um, you know to look up Bluehost, you had to go to this other set of domains and for you know the authoritative name for this is in a different zone. So you could Create all kinds of suspends and traverses and whatnot might be kind of interesting as well, either from a security perspective or from a network performance perspective. Um, the more redirection that you have, you know, the more potential for problems. So sec thing this doesn't have anything to worry about. I'm just suggesting it could be a, a potential issue and things that you may conduct in your career. Okay, so hopefully that's relatively straightforward. I sort of went through that relatively quickly. That's um, a typical kinds of process. Many of these steps being skipped as you learn things and you cache them. So the next person who comes around and wants to know something about uh, IETF.org doesn't have to go through the process of learning about org servers, right? That, at least that step will be skipped. So, um, let's now get into the more fun part of this. And let's consider what the infrastructure looks like and how it may or may not be the case work for CDF. If you were to ask one of the primary name servers at DePaul, which is NS1, NS2, NS4, it's actually NS3 that doesn't advertise itself. Um, what are the authoritative name servers for CDM by DePaul? Well, so I, you can, most of these commands should work. I, I might have messed up a copy and paste here, but you, could, you should be able to try them if you have a Unix system, a Mac or a Linux or a BSD, you should all work. Um, and you will notice, by the way, I use dig. Any real DNS person uses dig. No one uses NS lookup. They're real DNS. Okay, so when you go into your interviews or you're talking what about, about host. <laughs> well, host is for simple stuff, and I use that too. But um, NS lookup is essentially um, obsolete at that So dig is the place for There's actually another tool, the Trill, that's pretty good for DNS sex stuff, but I think it's the one that everyone uses if you're going to be familiar with getting to DNS, that's the tool of choice. So there's two servers. And I'm, just, I'm showing you a, a, a brief version of the output because of some of the flags in there. I'm showing you the two name servers that DePaul thinks are authoritative. And it also has the so-called, um, what we, in this case, is considered hints or the address record associated with those names. You'll see this, these numbers, this is the TTL. Those numbers look a little odd only because the DePaul's NS1, it's both an authoritative and caching server. So this is where some of that weirdness comes in. So it, it doesn't have, it's not giving you what's sort of the default value here. It's giving you one that it's went looked up before. So there's, um, I wouldn't say race conditions per se, but there's some things that happen um, that are between the authoritative and the resolver process that are not always obvious if you don't know those performance functions. Okay, so this, this is fine. There's two name servers for CDM. Okay, great. Okay. So, well, let's take a look. Let's take. Let's ask one of those CDM name servers. And of course, it's named CTI. That's because it was that was the old name of the department, right? Before that, it was CF. So, it's, so we've gone through a few generations of naming the department. That's not really important. So we're going to ask essentially the same question of the of the name server that is authoritative. So, by the way, so this is what the, the upper level of Paul. That you thinks is authoritative. Now, this the parent has a list of name servers. It's not authoritative. It says, "Here's what I've been told by the name servers for CDM." But these should be the authoritative source of knowledge. I don't have any information about CDM that Paul needs. They should. Now, this list of name servers should match this list, but clearly it does not. Okay. The, the two are here, which is fine. Now, is this a problem? Not really. Is it? 
Optimal? No. Um, is it, you won't really suffer, but you're probably not gaining an advantage that you think you may have had. Because a lot of queries will come through the information that, as you're traversing down. So you, the rest of these servers won't get as many queries as these two. Um, just because as you're traversing the tree, these will be hit more often. That's just that, that's natural, but that's fine. But you will pick up these servers eventually as you're querying this um, this set or something. There's a couple of things to point out uh, as we go through this. One of the things is not only that this is a mismatch, um, as long as we have these two and before. If we had a um, an ns4.cti listed in the parent and it wasn't here, that would be kind of bad because then there's a bunch of queries that are just never getting answered because it doesn't exist, right? But this isn't that big of a deal. But this is just to point out one little weird thing. I don't know if you can see the colors very well. It's supposed to be red. Probably just looks a little black to you. Um, but the TTL is different. For anything that's part of a set, a group of names that are all grouped together, which these are, this is a grouping of name servers or CDM that's probably needed. The name, the TTL, the class, and the type should all be the same. Well, that one's different. I don't know why it's zero. This would be nice if there was someone from CBM who is here that could tell us. My guess is there is no one from CBM who could tell us this. No one probably knows. It probably appeared one day when someone who no longer works here put it in, they made a mistake. So I, it's probably a mistake. I don't know why that is zero. If it's zero, what that means is don't ever cache it. So I don't know, is that a good thing? I don't know. It's, it's technically not in spec. They should all be the same. But it's, is it a problem? Eh, not really. That's not a problem. Okay. Well, what I did show you because it couldn't fit on the screen is the additional section. What are all the associated IP addresses with those names? You also will have gotten that in the answer if you didn't add all these flags. Now, there should be one address that's very much unlike the others. Can you see which one I'm talking about? Which address does not go with the others? The 10 address, right? Why is that unusual? Because it's external. Because <laughs> this is a RFC 1918 address. And, and this is information that's being delivered publicly. If you were outside the poll, this is the information you would get. Are you ever going to be able to get to 10.120.32 from outside the poll? No. So this server is never going to work for anyone outside the poll. We advertise it as it's available, but maybe if you're at home, you have a 10 network. I guess you could bring up this and you could bring up a 10.120.32 at home and you could pretend to be the poll. It's not much fun, but you could do that. Well. Again, we see the details a little bit different. Now, this isn't technically part of the set, so this is an out of spec or anything, but again, a little sloppiness. A couple of them are different. Why 1200? I don't know. Um, that was 12, I don't know, 1200 seemed like a nice number that day. Well, let's test some of these. And so these are some commands you can do to try to test them. All right, so I'm trying to test them up. From outside the pub, guess what happens? Doesn't work. Can't reach it. Can't get to it. Inaccessible from outside. So Mo did have an address, right? Mo's looks like it's got a public. You know, we should be able to get to it, but no, you can't. Try it from outside the pub. Can't get to it. That's also true for Bach and Mozart and NS3. Those four servers right away you cannot access from outside the pub. So five servers so far, including this local address one, completely inaccessible from outside the pub. Maybe that's why they have 11, right? For redundancy. <laughs> they must not know about views. I don't think it's that. <laughs> I think they just don't. You know, I think you a couple words too long in that sentence. Sure, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, but there may, but I think I know the reason why that is for some of those that are inaccessible. The ones that have public addresses. I think I know. It's a guess. Again, I. I suspect people in CDM are no longer here who would have provided rationale for this. But if you if you query those from within the ones that work within the poll, you'll notice that some of them in the flag section it sets a bit recursion desired. That means that resolver or that server will will do any query for you that you want. It'll perform that recursive function. It'll go off and chase stuff. So not only is it an authoritative server for CDM that's part of you, it's also full service resolver. Okay, that may not mean anything to you, but spend a few years in the community and get hit by a few DDoS attacks, and open DNS resolver is not something you like to see. 
If they're open, that means anybody can ask it any question from anywhere, and the answer will be sent back to wherever it was asked. DNS, most of the traffic is UDP, very easy to spoof UDP source address. Ask a question, a big answer goes back and goes back to a spoof victim. That's, in a nutshell, what happens. And probably, my guess is, I don't know how to fix the server so it only allows queries to do recursion from within Nepal, but also to provide authoritative service to everybody. So well, just as long as it works for people in Nepal. So I'll just filter it off for everybody, but it still works for Nepal. That's my guess is probably what happened. They probably didn't know how to fix it. So they kind of broke it a little bit by shielding it from everybody except people in Nepal. That's my guess. Educated guess. Um, yes, sir. Um, yes, sir. So how, does, how do you secure the deliberately public result, like 4222 or Google's AD? So when you ask how do they do it, so they, a lot of people, um, I don't know exactly how Google or OpenES do it. I can give you some of the ideas that um, we've used when I've done stuff. Um, you usually use a combination of things, like rate limiting, um, you put a lot more logic into your name server when it's normally in the default installations of them. Um, you have to be very careful measuring and monitoring. Um, I think early on, I don't know if Anthony will be watching this or not, but um, folks like OpenDNS and UltraDNS also have open resolvers too. Uh, I don't think people actually did a real lot. They just kind of kind of kept an eye on it. They were sort of waiting for bad things to happen and they would put in firewall filters to block off certain stuff when bad things happen. Um, but presumably, there's some logic in those servers that if someone's asking a question either uh, repeatedly with the same source address or maybe within the same range of the source address, some logic will kick in and wait a minute block it. Or one of the other things that's very popular now is this thing called um, RRL. It's a, it's a rate limiting mechanism built in that says if I detect that someone's asking something repeatedly, I'm going to send back a response with no answer in it. I'm going to set a bit called a truncated bit that indicates you should re-ask me using TCP. Re-ask your query using TCP, which forces you to set up a three-way handshake. If you're spoofed, well, you're not going to get the response to know to do the three-way handshake. You're not going to be able to figure out even how to do the three-way handshake because it's tough to guess the sequence numbers. And the truncated packet doesn't amplify the It's not amplified. Yeah. So, so those kinds of things, I don't know exactly how level three and Google would open the Yeah, they, they had probably their own proprietary techniques. But, oh, I don't know how got through ECP 38. <laughs> um, yeah, that's another. That'll never, um, I don't think that will happen. That's, that's a problem. So, continuing on, so there's another. Um, Problem here that I, I didn't make clear, but NS3 completely unavailable from anywhere. Now we knew it was unavailable, but I said it's from uh, outside. But it's also unavailable inside, as is CTIL PC. So literally more than half the name servers are unavailable from the outside, and some of them are completely unavailable. From the and this is kind of neat. One of the other servers doesn't even resolve. But look back, remember, if you look back here, Atkins, when we asked for the list, it gives us an address. But try to actually literally perform the lookup on this name. You can't do it. How do you get that? That's yeah, very weird. I, don't know how, I kind of poked around a little bit to see if I could figure that out, but I couldn't, I couldn't get this to resolve anywhere. So I don't know what trick they did to make that work. Um, that's, it's, uh, give me credit, that's a good one. Um, but that one, too, does not work. The irony of this part of the talk, I think, is the part I enjoy about all this computer science. DNS is really awful, but this one that is available publicly from everywhere, I thought was very ha, -ha funny. Microsoft DNS 6.1, I don't know, is that pretty old? Anyone know? No, I think that's the 2008 family. Those make well, it's very old still. <laughs> still will be surprised. Um, but then I can even get that information. Um, this is a little weird. Um, again, this shows that one of their name servers is both authoritative, but is also pull, um, performing a full resolver function. Now, what I did here was I said, okay, initial query at mode, and somebody else do this too, I think. 
I'm asking it, I'm asking it for the A record. I'm asking it for the MP4 address for this name. This is a special name. You can try this at home. When you ask for the name, this particular name, who am I, what you do, net, the answer that you're going to get back is specific to who asks. It's going to give you the IP address that asks it. So the address that can, comes back is 208 something, and then I'll try another time, it's 67 something. So the, the, the full service resolver that asks this question is one of these two. What are those things? It's OpenDNS. So one of these CDM servers are configured to forward everything to OpenDNS with maybe things that are not tall. I, I, that's actually caused me problems before when I had something that was set up to use a CDM name server. Because if, you've not, if you're not familiar with OpenDNS, um, by default, they'll give you like search pages if you typo something. And that's a problem if you actually need to get back an error. Um, so some of you probably thought, well, this is a clever thing. I'll let OpenDNS do all the work for me. I could do it. I'm at DePaul. I've got a pretty good connection. I don't know why you would forward it to OpenDNS. There's no need to. Um, it's just going to make it a little bit slower. Um, but maybe you wanted to get the blocking functionality on it. But one or more of the CDM servers do OpenDNS. Now, you'll notice in a few moments. Imagine what else we're forwarding to OpenDNS. There are probably some things that we probably wouldn't want to forward OpenDNS, by the way. Sometimes when you type out something, it's going to go to where we didn't expect. So that's maybe why we don't want OpenDNS being quick analysis. In fact, if you look, if you do the reserve, reverse mapping of some of the IP addresses in CDM's address space, look at all these cool names they got. They got all their own TLDs. This is the name for the reservation form. MSIE 6, that's a little scary. <laughs> I don't sure think there's a level domain. <laughs> I don't know that any of those names actually are meaningful anymore. They've, they've probably literally been there for years. But they're meaningless because there's no zone information with them. And there's a lot of this stuff. So there's a lot of cruft in CDM's name server name space. That's part of the point. On the right side, that doesn't work. I can't do a zone transfer to any of the name servers. But, but again, those are your DNS servers being run on Windows Server 2008, which just name I support just ended this month. So they're a little outdated. So that was fun, was it not? <laughs> they're running bind on Windows? They're not running bind, they're running Microsoft Windows oh. DNS. That's kind of a problem sometimes. Yeah, yeah. I think, if I understand correctly, again, I, I get a lot of this information secondhand because it's not without me having tried to help CDM fix this stuff. Every couple of years, I'll send a note to whoever one of the contacts, technical contacts is, and I say, OK, and I show them some examples like this. Just so you know, here's this doesn't work, this is messed up, you know, you really ought to fix this. I'll help you if you want. And I put it very politely. Well, now I'm thinking of being a nice guy, so now we're going to do more stuff like this. So publish this library. Because they never get a response back from anybody. And I think they just go, yeah, yeah, GDK. So I think a lot of that is just is crap built up over time and people come and gone. No one is really responsible for it anyway. And the interesting thing is, it mostly still works, doesn't it? You don't you wouldn't have known if I didn't tell you that there's all these problems. That's kind of the cool thing about DNS in a way, that even half broken, literally, it still mostly works. Now, you might academically look and say, well, it does take us a couple seconds longer, I've noticed, on average for some things. Um, it's probably not that measurable, but um, it will route around problems. So I guess that's kind of good news. There's a lot of bad news here. There's a lot of potential um, security issues that I'm not getting into that. Um, would really wreak havoc on this stuff. And uh, on some day that's going to happen. Windows 2008 with the Windows file share thing, you know, if that kind of stuff is there, you know, being up there vulnerable, but, you know, that's an old system. What else is on it? Who knows? It needs to change, I hope, at some point. CDM is unique because it's one of the few departments that ever has its own DNS infrastructure outside of IT. And there's been talk for years about changing that. Just hasn't happened. It should happen. They should probably not run it. Okay, so I think 
Can I go another 15 minutes or so? As long as you want. Okay. So this is the third section that I want to talk about. Operationally relevant. So I had a discussion with a former student who um, indicated to me that they had a discussion or ran into a situation with a faculty member about a project assignment. And in the nutshell, as it was related to me, the assignment was essentially come up with a network, design it, set up some firewall rules, protect it, and so on. And this former student of mine and his group set it up in such that DNS traffic that was going in and out of their network um, was permitted over both UDP 453 and TCP 453. But when they presented this solution, the network included, and there was more to it than just this, this was a very small part of it. But presented this to the class, the person was like, well, won't mark it wrong, but essentially you should block his computer three. And I got kind of mad the way this was relayed to me because generally you should not do that. And in fact, there's very few cases where you should do that. And most people don't know where those cases are. That's, that's my um, And there's not much danger there. Even the Paul CDM knows how to protect zone transfers. And that's usually the threat that people are worried about, right? You don't want people to zone transfer yourself. That's almost a non problem zone transfers. So what are we protecting against without filtering TCP 453? There's maybe some potential problems there, but my argument is there's actually things that use DNS over TCP. It's not much, um, but it's some. And so I had to reevaluate what I was telling students. And I went back and I looked and I said, okay, I think I'm still I'm not saying anything wrong, I'm still saying the right thing. But then I had to go back further and I had to evaluate what the operational community and the standards community says. Do they say we have to allow DNS over TCP or not? Or do they, are they a little vague about it? Because a lot of people are under the impression that it's optional or not required, and so therefore it's OK to filter. Most of the network, the community that I'm going to be visiting next week, and the DNS community, is kind of under the impression, let's say this tongue in cheek, that DNS over TCP is perfectly legitimate, and it's ridiculous that some places it doesn't work. Not only some places like people who purposely configure firewalls, but some gear purposely by default doesn't allow DNS over TCP. That's a real problem because there's things that need to do TCP rarely, but from time to time, maybe increasingly so. So I, I started doing what you might call a textual analysis of the standards and the specs and what people say and do we need to start saying something a little bit different? So I, this is, I'm not going to ask you guys this, um, but next week, this is the question I'm going to start off with. And I think most of the people in this room that will ask will say A, that you shouldn't filter this. But I'd be curious to know if anyone thinks yes. Does anyone, I don't know if anyone wants to be a little daunting with me up here in some sort of position of authority, but does anyone want to say it to me? Is that brain? Yeah. You can take it. I'll I can take it if you want to argue with me. Okay, so if we look back at the specs, RFCs for DNS were written back quite a number of years ago. They started in numbers around this range, about a little over a thousand. There's about four or five RFCs that talk about the early versions of DNS, the initial versions. This first one, this 1033, is the so called Domain Administrator's Operations Guide. Well, that's, you would think maybe we would find something in there about UDP and TCP. Not there's nothing in there about the so 1034, but that one's actually not referred to much anymore anyways. But 1034 is still referred to. There is very little mention, but there is mention of TCP in this RFC. And it says, queries are carried in UDP data grants or over TCP actions. That seems to imply that both UDP and TCP are legitimate and both should be supported, right? Seems to be the case. If you look at 1035, the language is a little bit softer. It says, well, TCP connections or virtual circuits, as we at least to refer to them, can be used, but it would be better to use UDP. So this is we're not so clear now. We, maybe TCP is optional. 1123 is a very infamous RFC. It's it's a, and there's a companion one for routers. But this one talks a lot about the requirements for internet hosts. You should have a DNS implementation. And you should support these ICMP messages and so forth. Well, in the section about DNS, it says about the transfer protocols. Must support UDP, should support TCP. So that must is clearly different than should. 
those weren't those words have very specific meanings in those RFCs and later RFCs must and should. Should is clearly not a strong as must. So people could interpret that as optional. Okay. Strongly recommended, but not necessarily required. There's another RFC that I found 93, so a little bit later now as the numbers go up, the RFCs will post later. Now this is an informational RFC, so it doesn't dictate or say how anything should be done. This is more of a reflection about some observations at present time. So this is a while ago, but you can see there's a sense that UDP is the protocol of choice. Right? So at that time, at least for the folks that were writing this draft, said, yes, this UDP is the one that you should use. Um, so again, the language is a little bit soft on TCP. Fast forward a little more DNS updates, so the dynamic DNS stuff. Not like dying DNS, like the, the company, but dynamic DNS update, which is a protocol mechanism they would use. There's a lot about TCP in here. And there's some parts of the DNS update, uh, some uh, update types that require TCP. So this one is one of the stronger ones. You, you, you get down to the places, must use TCP. So it does seem a direct implication that TCP is expected to work. DNS over TCP should work. You fast forward a little further. Um, this is a uh, fairly well-known spec for DNS, but some clarifications made to how DNS was found to be operating. And some folks to say, well, some people are not really implementing or doing this right, so let's clarify how this stuff is supposed to work. One of those sections talked about the truncated net, which we mentioned before. And um, so this is somewhat relevant in that it said you should uh, ignore the response, and you should, there's an expectation that the query will happen again with TCP. Now, it doesn't dictate that that should work, but there's really an implicit uh, signal here that uh, we expect to see TCP happen with larger replies. And in, in fact, in 97, is getting around the time where it's not deployed, um, but people are talking about things like DNSSEC and, and other things in DNS that make the records, the answers larger. And you needed TCP at one time to support larger answers because DNS over UDP was limited to 512 bytes for a very long time. So if you had more than 512 bytes in answer, you had to use TCP. Now, that's uh, somewhat mitigated by something later that we're coming to in a couple slides. Um, here's the, uh, one of the first DNSSEC-related RFCs that's now been obsoleted um, by later ones. But this clearly recognized that UDP would be a potential problem as the answer got larger. And so somewhat conflicting words here, possible necessity, right? But clearly the thinking is that TCP probably needs to be available um, for DNSSEC. This is the one that, that causes a little bit of problems for us. In, in the sense that DNS over TCP is often wrong. EDNS0 is an extension mechanism. It was designed to provide some additional features that weren't in DNS. Well, one of the things that it does at its base is it advertises a bigger packets or message size in DNS. So now you're not limited to 512 bytes. Well, if that's the case, if you can send larger UDP messages, then maybe we maybe don't need TCP. That's that's not what it says, but it certainly says it's preferable to use UDP if we can. So this weakens the argument for TCP, clearly. A little bit further, one of the more recent DNS sec, um, specs does um, go back to um, this idea of UDP and TCP, but it provides strong support for DNS. It doesn't say must support. TCP it sort of makes that implicit assumption, but it seems to be referring EDMS as possible. So UDP is still seems to be in the mind that that's the way to go. Of course, that was before a lot of the application reflection attacks. Um, now we come to more modern times. The reflection attacks have been happening. There's this spec was in particular written largely in response to Dan Bernstein's DNS server implementations. It's been popular, it's not as popular as it once was. But his implementation did not support TCP by default. His argument, which is a good one, was that it shouldn't need to support TCP. I never had large answers. Okay, but now you, Dan Bernstein, you need to implement TCP. That's what this RFC says to implementers. You need to implement the uh, TCP. But it does say something to operators. It doesn't say anything definitive. It says, we're not saying anything to operators. It would be nice if you support TCP, but you know, we're not going to tell you that you have to. 
not in this document. Okay, so still, we've got the implementers taken care of. When you write the software, it should do CCP, but the operator's still not being told that you must support the CCP. Um, and that document doesn't yet exist, and part of what this discussion will have next week is maybe this. Well, on the other hand, that last document says if you want it to work right, you should support the CCP. Do you know Sarah, oh, the, the next one? This one? What one do you want? The one, the, the last uh, RFC. Yeah. This one, right? This one, yeah. But it, it's if you don't support, but it's not a strong enough one. The A result in the finished result. So if you want it to work, right? So if you want it, if you want, if you want, if you want TCP to work, yeah, you, you know, but it's not strong enough language. It still doesn't say you must support TCP. It just says eh, it could fail. Um, you, you know, you might have some problems if you don't do it. But it doesn't tell you how to do it. It kind of leaves it up to you to decide if you want problems, you can have problems. And you have to ask. Are there going to be problems? That's a good question to ask. So maybe there really aren't going to be that many problems if you don't support TCP. That's a legitimate question to ask. So some more recent statements and things that have been talked about um, about this issue. If you look on um, ISC's knowledge base, they have a document that talks about this sort of thing. They conflate the idea between implementation and operations. They, they sort of imply that one should be allowed in GCP, but really that's not what the spec says. It, they, they kind of um, asserted that incorrectly. Um, but, that, but you can tell that's the implicit belief that people now have, is, or at least some people, that, oh, yeah, DNS or GCP is legitimate, it should be allowed. Um, Jeff Houston had put together an interesting white paper you can go read about, where he's, he doesn't necessarily say one thing about it, but he does this measurements on it. He finds that a little over two percent can't do TCP, and that actually might be a little low than what I, I tested some EDU stuff a long time ago, and there's a number of servers that didn't support it. I actually tested CDM's name servers, the ones that you can reach. It does support TCP, so that's good news, I guess. Um, but there's a significant population of people who can't do TCP, um, and now there's. There's more discussion about doing DNS over TCP stuff. They're drafts. They're not, they don't say you must support TCP. And, and they might not even say that, but they'll, they're proposing ways that require it. So, and there's DNSSEC is one of the big reasons also. But there's, there's more things that seem to be relying on or assuming that DNS over TCP should be available. Now, so let's ask the question, is there a DNS over TCP? There's actually very little. Um, it depends on your authoritative name server, what data it has. Practically no resolver will ever start the query with TCP. In fact, I think in this one of the specs, I'll have to dig this up, where it says you must start with UDP. Now, it's not hard to imagine implementation starting with TCP, but none of them do that. Okay. So that means well, all the queries aren't starting with TCP. Well, which ones will end up with TCP? Well, the ones that are larger, clearly, the answers that are larger. How many answers are larger than only 512 bytes, but whatever the, the larger buffer size is, now all the clients are starting to support this even to zero. Most of them support like 1K, 2K, 4K mesh sizes. Is there data that's larger than that? Not a lot. Some, but not a lot. So then the actual number of actual I have good numbers for you, but I've looked at some graphs, and there's not very much. And so you might argue, well, throw the baby out of the bathroom. Who cares? We, we missed some answers. Well, I suppose if you want to run your network that way, where it's a little bit unpredictable, you <laughs> can go right ahead. Um, I wouldn't do that. Why, why do that? What would be the reason for disallowing it? Well, there may be some good questions. One of the other reasons that, it's, that TCP is used, and this, I think, is a better argument than larger answers. So while there may not be many large answers, there is the case when authoritative servers are getting DDoSed. And how do they respond to that? Well, one of the ways they respond to that is by sending you back responses with the truncated bit. Saying, you know what? I'm under attack, so I'm going to force you to re-ask using TCP so I can validate the source address so I'm not reflecting or getting bombarded or whatever. So for that reason, I think it's a stronger reason to allow TCP, because the people who do that, you don't know who's going to do it. You have no control over that. If they send you back truncated flags, 
your filter to TCP, then you will never resolve anything from that name server. It won't work, right? You won't be able to use TCP. So, um, is there a danger though? What, what is the danger? So, if you if it's not that much, and maybe we don't care about the people who are under attack anyways, and maybe we're never under attack, although that's not a safe assumption. Um, what, what's the real danger if we do allow TCP? Well, I'm going to suggest to you the zone transfer issue is a non-problem. For a long time, people worry about zone transfer, so it's dangerous to let that out. Yeah, it might be bad if someone were able to transfer your zone, but no implementation will allow that by default. Not that I know. Even CDN gets that right, right? And they get a lot wrong. I say they, I don't, again, I'm not pointing at a specific person. I'm taking wax at the institution, so. It's sort of growing. Um, there are TCP-based attacks, clearly you know this, right? Sin floods, state exhaustion kinds of things. That is a potential real worry. DNS servers can be very busy. They have lots and lots of queries. Using very short transactions. You don't want a lot of TCP state on your host. You can help it, right? But we can deal with this too. We've had web servers that have lots of small, short transaction TCP. We, I think we can probably manage this. And it might be more preferable to deal with that kind of attack than these the reflection application attack if we had to choose one or the other. So, but there is a little bit of a known here. We don't know what, what it would be like if most of the DNS traffic were TCP. There might be some problems. I could imagine there would be. But I don't think they're insurmountable. Um, the opposite is also true, though. If you do filter TCP, well, you might not usually notice anything. Um, there are cases where you will notice it. Certainly, there'll be some answers you won't get. Because they don't fit in your UDP message, even with eDNS, they won't fit. Maybe not very many of those today. If you think DNSSEC is a thing, and you think it's going to take off, because it hasn't really yet, um, then some DNSSEC stuff won't work. If you care about DNSSEC, you definitely want DNS over TCP. If you don't care about DNSSEC, well, then there's not much else. But conceivably, there could be other things on um, DNSSEC that has large answers. The, the one of the things. Um, you may actually cause problems uh, for certain people um, unwittingly or knowingly. For instance, there's a talk, and this is like a decade ago. I, I was there, I was at this one, I remember this. Someone had talked, there was someone from Japan who described a situation where they would send a query off to a name server, they'd get a truncated response, and so they would retry using TCP and their network did block TCP, DNS over TCP, but they would never get a response because that network or some network in the middle did. And so now they have a resolver that's trying to resolve a name and can't. Well, what happens when you try to do TCP? You send a sin, right? And you wait for a while. And the response will be retried. Just wait for a while longer. So they had all these queries that were sort of in the queue, just in the, in the sin wait state, that weren't being processed. And so their, their server was getting a little bogged down because someone else's network was blocking the So while well, that's not necessarily common, you know, you can inflict damage on a third party that way too. So you, know, you might make a case for you know you good network. So the, 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 the question to ask then is I think maybe we might need a statement that says hey, to operators, here's what you must, must not do. Now, I'm not necessarily going to go out and say you must not filter DNS over TCP. There, there is at least a couple of situations where you don't need it. Uh, but I think some stronger wording needs to be said to operators. Because some people are saying filter it when they clearly have not a strong rationale for doing so. so and are probably causing harm. For the people that can get away with it, here's the reason why they would do it. Let's write it down. For everyone else, you must not filter it. That's Maybe what the document might say. I don't know. There may not be consensus on that. I'm not sure. Um, for most of the people I know, I think there probably is, but I'm trying to publish an RFC is get other people coming out of the woodwork who you hadn't heard from before. Um, you might disagree. So, and that's that's the essence of, of that third topic, and that's that's the end of what I had to say to you. So, with that, I'll say thank you for coming again, and, and here's the link to uh, my two pages. The one at Cumbria will have a link. Um, to a slide deck for me if you can't find it anywhere else. So with that, you, the witching hour is upon us. Um, if you want to hang out, if you want to do some dig stuff, apparently we have dig on this laptop and we can do that. Um, if you want to convene to some facility that has more than Coke and Sprite, we can do that too. 
I'm a walking distance, so I can hang out for a while if you like. Um, so now I will open the floor to, to all of you. What are some of the scenarios where you could not only get away with the, uh, blocking the PCP, but you know, for the uh, qualified exception? I'm a little disappointed that you'd have to ask that question. So I hate to, to provide you an answer, but I'm, okay, I will. Um, when you have an authoritative server that you run, and you know that all the data in your authoritative server is small, so the answers that you'll be providing are small, you know that they should be able to network see that. Like, let's, let's be um, conservative and say they'll never be more than 512 bytes, so no one should never need to do TCP with you. It's your authoritative server. And also, you don't expect to ever have to deal with DDoS attacks. And in a, and in a way that forces people to switch over to TCP. Right? Because that's one reason you might want to use it, because if people are flooding you for whatever reason, right? You might be getting hammered uh, with queries that you don't want to answer, even though you may you're not necessarily being reflected, they may be still trying to ask you a lot of questions. You may want to put some pressure on that. The way to do that would be one way to do that would be TCP. If you don't care about that, then that's a situation where yeah, they could filter DNS over TCP. That would be a relatively rare occurrence, I think, for most people. And even if it's, well, actually, no, it's, it's pretty common for a lot of search name servers. Um, but it, it's, in a lot of situations, you also have clients on the other side. And so if you do a global block all of DNS over TCP in both directions, then clients can't get where they may need to do TCP outbound too, right? So you're, if you're preventing that, um, then that's where you'll fit. So a very specific situation is DNS traffic to your name servers. Um, and you know your answers will never be larger than 512 bytes. Um, you might be able to get away with it. Which you, you can get away with it even, but as I'm saying, there's not that much DMs. You can get away with it and not really know it's a problem. But ideally, you have no problems. Um, that would be a case maybe where I would say, okay, if you really know what you're doing, you can do that. But even still, I would say, what's the harm? I, have you seen any problems with DNS over TCP? Back to the argument or impression that I referred to earlier, I made this argument about filtering DNS over TCP, but then later stated, I've never seen any DNS over TCP. Well, then why the hell are you worried about it? <laughs> so that would be my response to that. So, if, you know, why go through all the trouble of potentially breaking something and, and breaking potentially new features to solve a problem that doesn't exist? So, I guess I gave you more of an answer. I gave you a rebuttal to not doing it anyways. Yes, sir. How about DNS with LDAP or security? I don't understand the, the question. So, so I, LDAP uses TCP, so you would have to have TCP enabled for DNS for it to use it. You would? I don't know. How, how does LDAP fit into the world of DNS traffic? Isn't that completely a separate thing? Yeah, I suppose. But I'm saying with DNS, mm -hmm. And I know Kerberos uses only UDP. So, yeah, there's a Kerberos record type for dynamic update that I know that has to have TCP, right? Okay. Maybe that's what you're referring to? I think that's what I remember. I don't do dynamic DNS really, but I remember there's a Kerberos thing that requires DNS over TCP that might be the cell thing. So, I'm more of a networking person, so I'm usually on the free love side. You know, there's network people and the screen people usually put on edge, right? So you see where I fit. Um, so, and if you're a security person, that's fine. My argument to you would be, okay, if you're going to filter this stuff, you really need to give me a good reason for why you're doing it, and you need to back it up. Many times, security people don't seem to do a very good job of that. You're all world exposure. Well, so that's that, a fun, it's that's a philosophy a difference. It's a philosophy difference. So we build a network to make things work, right? So to network things together. And you know, it's awfully hard to grow the network and to add new features when you can't get stuff through. So there's a philosophical argument. So if that's the argument, okay, maybe that's not the argument. Um, but is it is it strong enough to counter? Well, you know, there is some DNS you know, right? So you got to come to the table with a good argument. So that, that'll be my argument. To you. So, and there may be those good arguments, uh, but many times they're not there. And many times it's because security people have very limited narrow view of the window. There are people sometimes do too, um, programmers also, right? Um, but broaden your perspective and, and think more broadly about 
the problem um, would be my advice to you. And your argument will be stronger for it. And you, if your if your argument is to prevent or block something, you know, you will you'll be much more convincing than just because, right? which is usually the answer I hear many times. So, okay, so I don't know, we could make this a discussion about blocking stuff if you want. What else? <coughs> Of the evils of nap too. We go down that route, but <laughs> that's been well traveled. I guess we'll say thank you one last time. Plenty of pizza, I think, left. Well, maybe not plenty, but some. Plenty of sodas. Sure, maybe. <laughs> okay, we're done. You can stop recording. All right, thank okay. you. Okay.